schools as the High Court dismisses a legal challenge to her ban on prayer rituals. A Muslim pupil at the school in North London had claimed that the ban breached her right to religious freedom. We'll be discussing what impact this ruling could have elsewhere. Also tonight, exercising its duty of care or encroaching on personal liberty. We'll discuss the government's plan to create the first smoke-free generation. In the past hour, MPs voted in favour of the plan, which would ban the sale of tobacco products to anyone born after 2008. But not everyone is convinced. Plus, this is why Brexit was the right thing to do. Nigel Farage accuses Belgian authorities of behaving like the Soviet Union for trying to close down a right-wing conference in Brussels while he was speaking. And a group of medical professionals lead calls for bras to be exempt from VAT, arguing they are a basic necessity. All that to come and much more on The UK Tonight. The High Court has dismissed a legal challenge brought by a Muslim student against the ban on prayer rituals at her school. The pupil had claimed that the policy at Michaela Community School in North London was discriminatory and breached her right to religious freedom. Well, the school's headteacher has hailed the court's decision, calling it a victory for all schools. Sky Shaman Freeman Powell has more. It's long been dubbed Britain's strictest school. Corridors are silent, pupils are supervised and prayer rituals banned. Earlier this year, restriction of prayers became the subject of a High Court appeal after a student argued that the school's stance amounted to discrimination. But now the High Court says that the school's rules are right and there are many who agree. Obviously, you know, there's going to be a big focus on <clears throat> the nature of the religion. But the fact was that Michaela School is a secular school. Um, the people went into the school knowing that and obviously the parents did. So then to kind of retroactively go and say that, you know, they wanted their <clears throat> sort of religious observance was obviously not right. So I think irrespective of, of the faith, I think this was absolutely the right decision. It's an argument backed by the judge in his written submissions and welcomed by the school's founder, Catherine Burblesing, a former government czar turned Britain's strictest head teacher. I think there's a line along the corridor. Yeah. Uh, if you drop your pencil, you get a detention. Uh, well, not, not if you... Not no, quite. if you were to not bring your pen in, you would get a detention. Um, She's never afraid to court controversy, but this time it was the High Court that was on her side. In a statement, she said, if parents do not like what Michaela is, they do not need to send their children to us adding that the judgment was a victory for all schools. The pupil, though disappointed, remained considered, saying, even though I lost, I still feel I did the right thing in seeking to challenge the ban. I tried my best and was true to myself and my religion. Others question the ramifications and wonder how the school's decision may impact wider society. I think... School is where we teach children how to become adults. And if we're teaching them that at school you can't pray and it's wrong to pray, then you're creating adults who see specifically Muslimness as somehow wrong. And I think that's a really kind of problematic thing to be teaching. The pupil will remain at Michaela to focus on her exams, whilst others will now study how the ruling will influence faith in British schools. Shimon Freeman Powell, Sky News. Now by Ashfaq Chowdhury, Chairman of the Association of Muslim Schools. Really appreciate you joining us on the UK tonight. Um, you've called this disappointing news, but a lot of people are saying, look, this shouldn't really have been a surprise because the school is non-religious. Um, the thing is, you see, we are in today's 21st century modern Britain. Um, and the first point that we teach our young people is British values. And when we actually show British values in various angles, that, that to me doesn't sound right. We had the Prime Minister actually invite Muslim leaders on Monday uh, to number 10 Downing Street to celebrate Eid. Uh, would he have banned people to those who wanted to pray um, in, in number 10? I'm sure that wouldn't have happened. The Prime Minister himself celebrated Diwali, rightly so. He's a practicing Hindu person and I respect him for that. 
in number 10, what do we say to young people that if you're Muslim, if you pray, then there's a different standard for you? But number 10 hasn't explicitly said that that building and that organisation is non-religious. This school and the, the head teacher herself has said that the parents and the children know what they're signing up for. They have children from many different denominations, races and religions at that school. And what the head teacher has said today is that they all make sacrifices, um, whatever religion they're from, so they can all come together as one. So if that is the case, why did this pupil and her family decide to send her to a non-religious school where it's very clear that this would not be allowed, rather than send her to a faith school? I think the argument is, is that in this country, only 4% or less than 4% of pupils are able to go to schools of Muslim faith. The 96% go to state schools. There isn't enough provision out there. Unfortunately, our Muslim children are at a disadvantage with the provision and the number of schools that are available. And on top of that, why should our society be banning things? Are we in Putin's Russia at the moment? We are in modern 21st century Britain, which is inclusive. No, no, no. I think it's unfair to, to, to you know, compare a school to, to that. In terms of... Look, let me just read you some of the school statement to put across their point of view. They said a school should be free to do what is right for the pupils it serves. The court's decision is therefore a victory for all schools. Schools should not be forced by one child to change its approach simply because they have decided they don't like something at that school. Multiculturalism works at Michaela, not because we've emptied the idea identity space of the school in order to accommodate difference, but because we have a clear identity which anyone can sign up to if they are willing to compromise. All faiths are welcome, but what they are saying is that religion has to be left at the door so that everybody can come together to be educated regardless of religion. And that's very clear. I, I, I choose to disagree. Let me beg to differ. I'd say uh, prayers are very um, small it requires minimal amount of time, sometimes five minutes or less. It doesn't require a huge amount of space. It requires the place of the people. Could it be done outside of the school city? day? Because, uh, I, you know, I'm just trying to, 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 to explain this to viewers who perhaps don't quite get it. From what we understand, Muslims are required to pray five times a day. Some decide to pray only three. Could that not be done outside the school day, which, you know, a long school day could be 8.30 till 4.30. Could that not be accommodated? Certainly, certain times of the year it can be. You're right in what you're saying. For example, now, uh, the prayers can be easily said outside school hours. But, you know, what is the harm if somebody prays for five minutes without interrupting anybody else, which is perfectly But what possible. the school Sometimes are also saying the is they have pupils who are Jehovah's Witness and they objected to the Shakespeare play Macbeth being studied because it had witches in it. There were Catholic pupils who objected to revision classes on a Sunday, which for them is a, a holy day. So all faiths have had to make compromises. And again, the parents sign up to that because it's a good school and they sign up to the ethos where, you know, everybody adheres to the same rules regardless of religion. I, I just, it just baffles me why somebody would struggle with that because the two other examples that you gave doesn't apply in this context. It will baffle some people why the to... parents struggle with it. As I said, they signed the papers at that school. Uh, yes, that's true. They would sign to all the policies of the school, but prayers, as I said, is an individual worship. It does not require a huge amount of space. It does not require sound, because mostly prayers and afternoon prayers do not have any sound. They simply have certain gestures that the people need to do. It just baffles me three to four minutes, which can be done during the break times. What is the big deal about it? OK, I accept your point, but the school is saying that it can be disruptive. That school day... I mean, we've heard about this school. It's incredibly strict. As a result, it gets impressive results. Tiger teaching, I think it's called. And the structure and the busy nature of the day, the strict head teacher, Catherine Burble Singh, has said, you know, if they allow for one faith, they'd have to allow for others, and that would be too disruptive. Do you not, um, do you not okay, accept let, that point? Let me ask you, you're, you're a person of logic. If somebody, for example, stands up somewhere and five minutes does whatever without making any noise, maybe just gets ups and up and down, which people do, you know, they sometimes kneel down. That, that's all it is. How would that be disruptive to others without making any kind of noise staying where they are? But you can imagine if every pupil in that class decided to do something related to their faith at some point in the school day during that class, that would be disruptive. Well, the Muslim faith, the good thing is we have accommodation. We have windows of timings. Usually the afternoon prayers has a large window, about two to three hours. So that can always be accommodated in a break without disrupting mm. anyone else. Indeed, you know, the school allowed in the playground, that's even not a problem. 
that could be done outside of the playground without disturbing anyone else. So I fundamentally disagree that it can be done. I believe it can be done without disrupting others. We must be respectful of the school rules. I'm 100% for that. But I believe prayers can be done without disrupting school rules. OK. Ashraf Chowdhury, really appreciate your time uh, this evening to, to put across your point of view. Uh, Ashraf Chowdhury, their chairman of the Association of Muslim Schools, um, giving their reaction to that judge's ruling today uh, that a non-religious school can ban prayers. Let's speak now to Andrew Copson, Chief Executive of Humanist UK. I'll just start first, if I can, Mr Copson, with a, a reaction to what we heard there from Ashfaq Chowdhury. Well, I think that the general arguments that he makes are ones that many people will have sympathy with. There are lots of schools probably that do and can accommodate religious practices. The question in this case was whether this specific school was right in, in saying that its circumstances prevented it from doing so and did they have a good case for saying um, that they shouldn't. What have you made of this decision? The head teacher said it's a victory for all schools. Schools should be able to decide how they teach their pupils and what faith looks like in their school, if it's included at all. It's actually a very detailed uh, and comprehensive judgment. It's 83 pages for a, a case like this on freedom of religion or belief. That's, that's quite a lengthy document. And I think the first thing I would say that I thought on reading it was that it was very specific to this school. I mean, the temptation is to draw wider social lessons from it, and you know, I'm happy to do that um, in, in, in various different ways. But it is very much about this specific school, which is a school that values conformity, as you've said earlier in your questions, um, is very disciplined by their definition of what that means and that was able to persuade the court, therefore, that you know, allowing individuals to have freedom of worship during the school day was incompatible with that, um, with that pattern of life that parents had chosen, that pupils knew they were signing up for, and so on and so forth. So I think that that's the first thing to say, is that it's very bound up with the specific circumstances of the school in question. I think it does have general lessons for us as a society, but I'd say the most important general lesson that came out of the judgment was that this is very complicated. We really feel the need at the moment for national guidance guidance that will help schools not have to take cases like this um, and allow parents and pupils to have clear expectations of what they can and can't do in the school day. Yeah, you know this area well. And as you said, the guidance, well, a lot of schools wouldn't really call it guidance. Schools are being left to their own devices on this. But what is the current guidance at the moment when it comes to schools? Because, of course, you have so many different types of schools yeah. in the UK. There are faith schools for those who want their children to attend them. There are all sorts of schools. So what is the government saying schools should be doing? Because the Education Secretary today supported the judge's decision. Yes, I mean, the, the, the comments of Education Secretaries from time to time aren't really, um, like you say, proper guidance and what is needed. There's, there's almost no guidance to support schools. I mean, what we have is the legal framework which says that every person in this country has the right to freedom of religion or belief, but that that can be restricted in certain circumstances. It can be restricted to prevent harms to others. It can be restricted by public authorities like schools for other reasons if they can show that those reasons are proportionate. In this case, the school had a number of reasons for saying this was proportionate. What I think government really needs to do is to talk to a whole range of schools, find out where the real problems currently are on the ground and issue national guidance that will assist schools in not having to go to court every time um, and uh, know what you know, accommodations they should and shouldn't be making and how they can make those decisions. Because although the school has, has won today, as you say, they, they, I don't think this case should really have ever happened. Everyone's expectations in our school system should have been clear enough to prevent it from happening. Now, for me, I think, and this is why I slightly disagree with one of the questions you, you put earlier, um, I think that actually it doesn't matter whether a state school is a faith school or a so-called secular school. The important starting point is to see how we can respect maximally the freedom of religion and belief of every person, but also balance that against the need for an inclusive school culture. So, for example, we're the only country in the world that still requires Christian daily worship in our schools. Lots of schools do it, some schools don't. That's a law that dates from 1944, and the sort of discussions we're having now would be completely you know, foreign uh, as, as concepts to the, the world of 1944. That shows we need to update our thinking about this. What do you think the best way to be truly inclusive in schools is then? Because, you know, the big question is, out of all of this, how do we balance protection and freedom of religion and beliefs and fair and inclusive education for all in the United Kingdom? You're absolutely right. That is the big question. And it is probably too big a question to answer in, in, in a few seconds now. The, the approach that I would favour would start from... Um, the question of what do we want the outcomes to be. What we want young people to experience in school is to learn about and with and from people from a range of different backgrounds in an environment that feels safe and in an environment where if they have genuine convictions, freedom of belief should be 
um, upheld as far as it can be. Now, I think the most persuasive um, argument the school had in this case was that um, they worried that if some pupils began to pray and to have a um, visible uh, prayer, that this would become a source of intimidation to, to others and the people who didn't want to um, pray would be forced to pray. That's what the school said. There's evidence that that happens in other places. Um, but it's on schools to help build the cultures where that, that sort of bullying and intimidation wouldn't happen, cultures of genuine freedom and equality. Um, how they do that? Well, it's done through, I think, school assemblies. Let's get rid of the law requiring collective worship, Christian worship. Let's bring in a law requiring inclusive assemblies that draw on a range of traditions. Let's give space in the curriculum for children to genuinely learn about a wide range of different religions and beliefs. And let's try and foster um, mutual respect for people's different practices where they can be accommodated. OK, Andrew Copson, Chief Executive of the Humanist Society. Uh, really good to have you on the UK tonight, uh, this evening. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, now, uh, Birmingham Airport is back open this evening after a security alert earlier on today. An Aer Lingus plane left the airport this afternoon, bound for Belfast, but it turned round just half an hour later. A statement has been released this evening, the airline saying that the plane turned round because of an undeclared item which was found on board. Well, shortly after the plane's arrival, police vehicles could be seen gathering close to where it came to a halt, and a short time after that... Buses then approached the plane and passengers could be seen leaving the aircraft. Flight operations were suspended until around 6 o'clock this evening, while trains operating on the line next to the airport were also affected. While well, this statement was released just over an hour ago, West Midlands Police said that the item found on board was not suspicious and the incident is now being treated as a false call with very good intent. Now, in the past hour, MPs have voted in favour of the government's plan to ban young people from smoking. The proposals would make it illegal to sell tobacco products to anyone born after 2009 to create the world's first smoke-free generation. Now, the government says it has a duty to protect the next generation. However, critics, including some Tory MPs, say that this plan is an unacceptable breach of personal liberties. Order! The eyes to the right... 383. The nose to the left, 67. Wow. So, decisive victory, but never really in doubt, given Labour's support for this bill. However, not everyone was happy, least of all, the former Prime Minister Liz Truss. This is what she had to say during the debate that took place this afternoon. We're seeing not just on tobacco, but also on sugar, also on alcohol, also on meat, a group of people who want to push an agenda which is about limiting people's personal freedom. Yeah. And I think that is fundamentally yeah. wrong. Yeah. Well, we can speak now to Simon Clark, Chief Executive of Forest, which is a pro-smoking lobby group. Um, Simon, why is this not a good idea, in your opinion? Hello, Sarah Jane. Well, uh, we're pro-choice, not pro-smoking. We think this bill will infantilise future generations of adults. Uh, the reality is, when you are 18, you are legally an adult. You can purchase alcohol, you can drive a car, you can join the army, and, of course, you can vote. So if you can do all that at the age of 18, we think you should be allowed to choose whether or not you wish to buy cigarettes and other tobacco products. Now, we know that there are serious health risks uh, associated with smoking. I mean, there can't be a sane adult uh, or even child in the country who isn't well aware of that. Children are well educated about the health risks of smoking at school. And, of course, there is already a law in place that makes it illegal to sell tobacco to anyone under the age of 18. So this bill is not going to make any difference to children. It's going to punish people who are adults and who may wish to choose to smoke. Now, I realise that in the modern day... Why not protect them? As you said, there's so much medical evidence. And when you look at statistics from the NHS, you know, the statistics of people presenting to hospital or to their GP with any kind of illness that can be traced back to smoking is huge. So why not just protect people? What's so crazy and unconservative and 
nanny state about that, wanting to protect people? Well, the problem is that only one smoking-related disease, lung cancer, is clearly um, a result of, of smoking. About 80% of all people who get lung cancer um, have been smokers. Now, I'm not suggesting that smoking isn't responsible for other illnesses as well, but many of them are multifactorial. So it's difficult to say it's just down to smoking, in which case, how many things do Why we start banning? Why does every GP say, then, give up the fags? Well, uh, GPs don't run the world, as far as I'm uh, aware, and even politicians and ministers shouldn't be telling adults how to live their lives. As long as people are educated about the serious health risks associated with smoking, then once you're an adult at the age of 18, you have to be allowed in a free society to make your own choices. And the problem with this is, is that prohibition never works. And this is creeping prohibition. Every year, they're going to raise the age of sale by one year until eventually I mean, within but that generation will never miss it, then? You, 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 you can't miss what you don't know about. Well, do you really think it's going to stop young people from smoking? You actually potentially... Well, I like to think if my son or daughter never came across a cigarette in their life, didn't see anyone that smoked, they wouldn't really be interested. Well, the greatest... Because they wouldn't know about well, it. Greatest... They might save their lives. And I suppose, you know, there are plenty of illegal drugs out there at the moment, and young people seem to get their hands on, on them. Uh, you know, uh, cannabis, for example. I mean, it's quite funny. A lot of the politicians who support the legalisation of cannabis are the same people who want to uh, raise the ale of sale tobacco and eventually prohibit tobacco. But, but some people can argue for the medicinal benefits of cannabis. I mean, that's a whole other argument. Nobody can argue for any medi medicinal or positive benefits of smoking. Well, I can, because I'm not a smoker, but I've met many, many people in my lifetime. What are they? Uh, I've met... Well, I can, we've done research which shows that a great many smokers get pleasure from smoking. This is a war on pleasure. Uh, and the fact... I mean, you cannot deny that there are many people... Go for who a walk. Oh, for goodness sake. I mean... That... Well, no, I'm just saying there are other options out there that won't damage your health. You're putting across one point of view. Yeah. But, it's my job okay, to put across Okay, but the then other. do we start banning certain types of food? Because I mean, I'm overweight. I don't smoke, but I'm overweight. I know I should lose weight, but I don't want the government forcing me to lose weight. I don't want the government banning donuts or fatty foods and dairy products to force me not to gain weight. It's ridiculous. People... What if you ended up in hospital with something serious linked to your lifestyle and you thought... Should have made better choices. Well, I'll Would take... Did you not regret that? No, because I've lived my life, I've enjoyed my life, uh, you know, and the same with a lot of smokers. I mean, smokers know the health risks, and, but they accept, in many cases, they accept the health risks because they enjoy it. Also, there are a lot of smokers who take comfort from smoking. They're in stressful jobs or they live in a stressful uh, environment and smoking is a comfort to them. It's not up to government to take that away from them. Well, what about it, st the stress it's putting on the NHS, the people around them, their friends and loved ones who are watching them damage their health and also probably breathing in second-hand smoke? Well, it's interesting you mentioned the NHS because we're often told that smokers are, are costing uh, the NHS a huge sum of money. Smoking-related diseases are estimated to cost the NHS £2.5 billion a year, and yet smokers, through tobacco taxation, contribute £12 million to the Treasury every single year. So smokers should not feel guilty for their habit. They more than pay their way in society. And I come back to this thing that, as an adult, you have to be allowed to make your own choices, your own decisions. I mean, what sort of world are we can create where government takes all the decisions for us? This will not end with smoking. As soon as this bill passes, the anti-smoking lobby will quickly move on. They'll start to demand more and more restrictions on vaping, for example. There'll be demands from the public health lobby to restrict uh, uh, sales of alcohol. This might not happen overnight. It'll happen within the next 10, 15 years. And you can be sure that when the farcical aspect of this law hits home, which, in other words, a 30-year-old can buy tobacco, but a 29-year-old won't be allowed to, that'll happen within 10, 15 years, People will realise it's fast school, but at that stage, the anti-smoking lobby will simply say, well, let's ban the sale of cigarettes to everybody, to Thank all you. adults, regardless of their age. That's where we go. We're going towards prohibition. Prohibition never works. OK. Simon Clark, really interested to hear from you this evening. Thank you so much for your time. Director of Forest, a smokers' lobby group. Simon Clark there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, still to come here on the UK tonight, Nigel Farage hits out at Cancel Culture. This is as police try to shut down a right-wing conference in Belgium. Also ahead, we'll have all the details as a new study lays bare the shocking extent of plastic waste in the UK. And stay with us to see the newly crowned Young Magician of the Year conjure up a few tricks right here in the studio.
I'm Martin Brunt, and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soham murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. <laughs> Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News, at the Old Bailey. Nigel Farage has hit out at what he called cancel culture. This is after authorities in Brussels tried to shut down a right-wing conference while the former UKIP leader was speaking. The conference had already struggled to find a venue, with two places cancelling the booking, the event eventually finding a home at a nightclub on the outskirts of the city. And speaking to Sky News after the police arrived, Mr Farage said that it's the kind of behaviour that tells him Brexit was the right thing to do. From Brussels, here's our political correspondent, Darren McCaffrey. Forced out and not allowed back in. Nigel Farage and Conservative politicians from across Europe find themselves on the wrong side of the police in Brussels today. Just doing my job, so. yeah. With the conference descending into chaos, the local mayor branded it an extremist event that was not welcome in the city. Have you seen the people in the room? I mean, do, 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 do this look like a bunch of yobs to you? Far, far from it. These are a lot of very respectable, very eminent people. I mean, we've got bishops here, we've got prime minister of a country here, we've got European royal family here. I mean, these are very respectable people. There's also no protest outside of any significance at all. It's about closing down an ideology. And for a man making a speech about cancer culture, he seemed to be rather enjoying this moment. Are you prepared generally to be pulled off the stage? I couldn't wait. I was ready for him. I was ready for him. Apparently, apparently they came in whilst I was on stage, saw the cameras and then withdrew. Pity. Tensions did, however, rise as organisers scrambled to deal with what would be the third cancellation in as many days with police insistent outside that everyone needed to go. I told you earlier, uh, the authorities have decided to shut off the event and I'm here to signify the decision. So we have the papers here and I'm here to enforce the, the decision. Meanwhile, inside the venue, the conference limped on with Sawala Braverman's speech meant to be a punchy attack on her old boss, the Prime Minister, completely overshadowed. Uh, just about your reaction to what's gone on here today. It's a real shame that the, the Thought Police, um, instructed by the Mayor of Brussels, has saw fit to try and undermine and uh, denigrate what is free speech and free debate. Um, I, I remember the words of Mrs Thatcher, and I'm going to misquote her, but the more ridiculous and far-fetched and extremist their attempts are to silence us, the more cheered on I am, because it just shows that they've lost, they've lost the political argument. The Hungarian Prime Minister is due here tomorrow, but that is now in doubt. The organisers seem determined to push on. I invite you to stay with us for as long as the festivities go on. Today was just the latest skirmish in the constant battles around free speech. 
But the rather blunt use of the police, far from shutting these politicians up, seemed only to amplify their arguments. Dara McCaffrey, Sky News in Brussels. Still to come here on the UK tonight, a group of medical professionals call for bras to be exempt from VAT. We'll be discussing that next. Hello, welcome back to the UK tonight. Now, a group of medical professionals is calling for bras to be exempt from VAT, arguing they are a basic necessity. Well, VAT was abolished for period products three years ago, and the Society of Radiographers says that bras should be treated the same. They're arguing that taxing bras could be discri considered discriminatory under the Equality Act. Uh, well, I'm joined in the studio tonight by Dr Nikita Kanani. GP and former medical director of primary care for NHS England and also joining us from Leeds the influencer Chloe Woods who's behind the Fuller Bust Inspo account on Instagram. Ladies, um, good evening to you both. It seems a ridiculous question to ask but I'm going to start with it anyway. Uh, doctor, why do women need to wear a bra? Why is it an essential item? Well, I mean, um, look, we it's, it's really good for a start that we're talking about this mm -hmm. because actually it's something that we don't talk about very often. Um, but we all wear bras because we need support and it depends on your bra size, but you often need a bigger and more structured bra um, if you have a bigger breast. Mm -hmm. If you have a smaller breast, actually people still value a little bit of support, and particularly when you're doing something that involves more than um, sitting around. So if you're moving around, taking on exercise, um, it's important to have that structure. And what we find is as your uh, bra size gets bigger, you're more likely to suffer from 
musculoskeletal um, issues, so back pain, shoulder pain. And I've had patients who have really bad sore shoulders um, because of ill-fitting bras as well. And ultimately, some people can't work because they're so uncomfortable in the bras that they do have. Because that's what we're told, isn't it? That it's an essential. Women have to wear them for physical health, mm -hmm. mental health. And we're told to go for regular fittings because women's bodies, we all know, change mm -hmm. and so to go for a regular fitting you may change bra size so that's expensive yeah. and it's essential as you said for women to wear the right fitting bra do you think vat should be ditched i do actually and i think this is a really timely call following the uh, tampon tax um mm -hmm. that, that you mentioned at the top uh, that was 2021 yeah. which which basically said you know let's be fair about the way that we apply tax and vat it shouldn't be that women who have to use or wear certain products um essentially pay more because of it uh, because of the pleasure of having to do it uh, Nikita, let's bring in uh, mm. Chloe in Leeds because Chloe, you set up your Instagram account a number of years ago now. Um, why did you do that? Why did you need to represent bigger busted women? What, what was the space there that you needed, to, needed to, to, to fill, if you like? I think from personal experience, having a fuller bust, I saw an importance in how it affects our lives and our mental and physical well-being and I felt that it was really important to bring a community together to be able to support people with their confidence in their mind body and boobs because mm. a bra really does affect like our boobs really do affect our different elements of our lives mm. yeah it's not just about physical health it's about mental health as well and Chloe I want to talk about another hidden tax not just VAT but the fact that if you are above a D cup your bras tend to be more expensive, especially if you want one that is supportive and fits you well. You go into high street stores, big brands, big well-known retailers, their sizing stops at a D and the average breast size of a woman in the UK is far larger than that. Yeah. What do you think about the hidden tax, the more expensive, well, the bigger your bust, the more expensive your bra. Does that need to change? Yeah, I think, of course, with a fuller bust bra that has extra elements to support a fuller bust, um, it's going to cost more. And I think that's what brings the importance of being able to being able to remove this tax because we do have a larger expense and we are the people that often are experiencing these physical issues, this pain and that kind of mental and physical well-being impact. Yeah, talk to us about the, the, the mental and, and, and well-being impact because a lot of women get in touch with you through your Instagram account to talk about, you know, th their feelings on this, is this issue, because it can be, a woman's relationship with her chest can be quite complicated, can't it? Especially if you're bigger busted. Yeah. I think there are a lot of elements in our lives that impact us and particularly for me as a, a dance instructor, I teach with SOS Dance and we're all about building confidence and feeling empowered in your body and I've noticed creating events with sports bra talks and providing that education that a lot of people have shared how it can really hold them back from attending dance classes, fitness mm -hmm. classes and obviously that's having an impact on our physical well-being as well because mm -hmm. we're being held back or we're not feeling confident because we're not feeling supported in those classes with not with not having the right size yeah Nikita literally not feeling supported because you know that's a whole other market isn't it, it is. the sports bra market and some sports bras if you're a bigger busted woman can cut if you want a really good one can cost a hundred pounds oh, yes yeah. I mean absolutely and that's literally you know cutting people out of not just sport but exercise, yeah, physical community, well-being. Community, just meeting people and, you know, doing things that, that make you feel better. Um, and actually, even for sports bras, it's important to get fittings. Mm. But with a dearth of sort of physical stores that you can go into and proper bra fittings, you know, mm. places, um, actually people are just not getting fitted properly as well for sports bras or for their standard bras, causing lots and lots of problems, both, as we said, psychologically and physically. Yeah, Chloe, what's your experience of, of fittings? Because as... Um, um, the doctor said here in the studio, you know, not all shops offer it and you sort of have yeah. to guess a bit, don't you? And so many women will say when they do finally go for a proper fitting, they'll be told, oh, you've been wearing the, the wrong size bra for God knows how many years. 
Yeah, there is on the high street, there is a real lack of choice and option for people with a fuller bus. And so often we get fit into a size, we get squashed into a size and it's just not the right thing for us. It's not supported. There's really limited options out there. I have Bra Fit with Bra Visma previously who are a great advocate for fuller bus. I'm a double J cup size myself. So it's one of the few places on the high street that I can go for that bra fitting. And it can be really life changing um, to have that support and to have that right size. When patients come to you and speak about these kind of issues, you know, you've talked about the, 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 the back pain and the neck pain, but what are they talking to you about their sort of emotional health as well? Yeah. Because it's not just, you know, being able to fit into the right bra. You know, talk about breast surgery is spoken about so openly yeah. now. People, yeah. you know, either wanting bigger boobs or a breast reduction. It's sort of become... You know, if people are unhappy about it, they see surgery as a way around it. Yeah, I think I think it's a real risk. And this, I mean, I'm really glad that Clary and others are really pushing a, bo a body mm. positive movement. Um, mm. I've got a daughter who's 12 who is, you know, already looking in the mirror and looking herself through mm. a lens that I just don't see. Um, yeah. And I get patients coming in, you know, often more worried about um, their breasts than a than a than a sort of chronic um, mm. disease that mm -hmm. we might need to talk about. Um, so there's a real need now for us to kind of refocus on women are made to be different, you know, sizes and shapes yeah. and um, celebrating that. Um, and then making sure that we get rid of taxes that are fundamentally, um, uh, you know, in a, uh, unfair for the women in our society today. Yeah, we need to talk about breast health more. Uh, Dr Nikita Kanani and Chloe Woods joining us from Leeds. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, coming up on the UK tonight, the Magic Circle's Young Magician of the Year is going to be right here in the studio to show us some tricks. And a battle on the bridge. We'll talk about Chelsea's remarkable penalty spat last night. Well, that's coming. Obviously, any parent who's got the means to do so is going to look to help younger members of their family, especially in the current situation where a lot of younger people are struggling to get on the housing ladder. I think about half of baby boomers were able to own their own house by the time they were 30. Now, for millennials, it's under 30%. So you can understand in individual situations why people do that. But when you sort of step back and you apply that society-wide, it's not a very healthy situation where you have a great swathe of the population only able to get on in life if they get a handout from their parents, more to the point, before their parents are dying. You know, once upon a time, you might expect to get an inheritance, but now it's having to happen a lot earlier, and that's not just for obviously getting on the housing ladder. With that comes the issue of having children. So we find ourselves in a very unhealthy situation where you're having to try to perpetuate the next generation by giving away as much of your money as you can now. It's not the easiest way of doing it, especially given that in this country, a lot of you know, finance is wrapped up in assets, it's wrapped up in wealth, it's wrapped up in your own home. And of course, that's even take, before we take into account the fact that things like social care as you get older is getting a lot more expensive and a lot more people are needing social care because things like dementia are becoming a lot more prevalent. I don't think you can sort of sit there and say to an individual, no, you shouldn't give your child, you know, your 30 year old son or daughter money, that's a bad thing. But when you take it in the round as a society wide issue, I think it's a rather unhealthy situation. I don't think it's particularly unhealthy, and I also don't think there's a lot of shame associated with this. I've been seeing a lot of headlines and people have been making, uh, been admitting to feeling embarrassed or mortified about seek, uh, seeking money from parents. But actually, if you look at the stats, over the last 50 years, there's been a 158% increase on UK average uh, house prices. Look at London. The average house price in London is 730 thousand pounds. People can't get a house nowadays. So going to your mum and dad, instead of seeking cheap liquidity options, I don't think is at all embarrassing. There's no shame. And I definitely don't think it's unhealthy. People are working. They you know, leave school, leave university, and they enter the job market at the same time. Two different people. One is going to get on the housing ladder. One is going to be able to have children. One is going to be able to do lots of things because their parents can give them money and the other one can't. And it doesn't matter what, how much work that person puts in necessarily. They know that whatever they do, they're at a disadvantage behind this other person simply because this other person's parents bought a house or saved properly at a different time. That doesn't incentivise people to push on. It doesn't incentivise a particularly competitive workplace. And I think it actually sets in a degree of, you don't want to say resentment, but almost sort of yeah, resigned to your fate. 
Uh, welcome back. You're watching The UK Tonight. On the way, the youngest ever winner of the Magic Circle's Young Magician of the Year will be right here in the studio performing some tricks for us. Uh, Teddy, though, is here with the sport. And just ask me if he's going to saw someone in half. He's <laughs> not so, to do that anymore. Is that Victorian, is it? Victorian, yeah. yeah I don't, I don't know. I don't yeah. know if we'd allow that on Sky News. That's probably not the best. I'm hoping for a card trick or I'm something I'm sure it's a trick like of the eye anyway. So, yeah. yeah. Talking of tricks, um, Chelsea, um, it's been a really turbulent season for them, hasn't yes. it? And then last night, that 6-0 thrashing of Everton, their biggest win of the season. But all people have been talking today about today is that penalty spat. What on earth went on? Yeah, you can see all the players clustered around here. You can see Cole Palmer with the ball. It's been a sensational signing, probably the optimistic part of Chelsea's season. Mm. Went up to 20 goals last night. They already got the perfect hat-trick, two feet a header going into this one in the second half, around 60 minutes. That Chelsea won a penalty. Here's the designated penalty taker, 100% record, eight from eight. But suddenly, Nani Madueke wanted it. Nicholas Jackson seemed oh, to want the penalty, trying to wrestle him. <laughs> it took Conor Gallagher uh, to come over. You can see him just uh, there shouting at Nicholas Jackson at the back behind Cole Palmer to sort it out the skipper to, to make amends. In the end, Palmer took it after all this pressure and all the, all the hullabaloo scored to make it four goals for him in the game. Only the fourth player in Premier League history from Chelsea to do that. Frank Lampard did it twice. Uh, but quite a sensational uh, night for Cole Palmer. Yeah, a little bit overshadowed by that. A lot of people saying Deli Ali made the point on Monday Night Football. It was live on Sky Sports. Said, mm. well, it's all very well wanting it if you're 4-0. But when Cole Palmer's your main penalty taker, yeah. I bet no one's arguing with him when it's 0-0 <laughs> in, in a pressure moment at the end of a game. But it did overshadow a great result for Chelsea and a real good run, actually. They're other, outside the top three in the Premier League, Liverpool, Manchester City and Arsenal got the best record this mm. season. And they're absolutely flying in terms of um, th this, this part of the year. They could finish sixth. They've got the FA Cup semi finals yeah. to come against City. So it could be a good end for for Mauricio Pochettino, but he said he was very upset by what he saw there. Yeah, I bet he was. And um, before we move on to the rest of the sport, can we just have a little bit more about Cole Palmer? Because it's the Euros this summer. He's got to go with England, hasn't he? Yeah, he's got 11 goals, I think, in his last six or seven games in all competitions. He's played in lots of different positions, signed from Manchester City in the summer. Left footed, but scores from all different types of angles and goals. Wonderful goal here from distance with his right foot that just curled in that you can watch there. The problem he'll face for Gareth Southgate's England team is if he was a defender or a holding midfielder, mm -hmm probably have a really good shoe-in of, of getting a place, but they've got so many attacking options. A, a player he left Manchester City, perhaps, in competition with Phil Foden is there. We've got Harry Kane, of course. We've got Jack Grealish, Bukayo Saka, James Madison, Jude Bellingham, a raft of players. But you think if they can push to get 26 players, he's got a good chance. He's very versatile, can play midfield, can play across uh, the front, and possibly even as a substitute for Harry Kane. He's played at a false nine for Chelsea mm. up front, so you've got to think he's got to be in there as a 21-year-old in that kind of form. Uh, but that is uh, uh, Cole Palmer from last night. Tonight, all about Champions League semi-final lineup. We'll update you on the games uh, in the quarterfinals in just a sec. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. This is a glimpse into the future of AFC Bournemouth, a multi-million pound training ground that is getting closer to transforming the club completely. Owner and American businessman Bill Foley was visiting from his home in Las Vegas, an opportunity to see his vision becoming reality. It looks spectacular. It looks spectacular, but maybe that's the, that's the difference you've got. Could we have saved a few million pounds? <laughs> maybe. But uh, yeah, it certainly looks incredible, that's for it's, sure. It's, uh, I mean, women's academy, first team, um, unbelievable facilities are, are going to be here. It's, uh, this will be one of the best training, training facilities in the league. When it's finished, it's going to be unbelievable. Despite being Bournemouth's owner for less than 18 months, he's been bullish with his predictions about survival and made huge strides off the pitch in an industry that promises fans so much but fails to deliver. So how has he kept his word? Transparency, be honest, I'll always tell the truth and always be, and really always be honest. And uh, I, had, I have big ambitions for this team and I know we can do it because I've, I've done it. I've done it with the, with the Golden Knights, our, our hockey club. So you've translated what you did in Vegas to Bournemouth with the same model, the same infrastructure, the same plans? Same, same plan, same program. It's expensive. You've got to put a lot of money behind your... Um, to keep your word, you've got to put a, lot, put a lot of money behind... This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Uh, thanks very much, Teddy. Now, campaigners say that the UK's plastic crisis is getting out of control as a new report reveals households are throwing away an estimated 1.7 billion pieces of plastic every week. 
Greenpeace are warning that recycling will never be able to catch up with the amount of waste that's being produced. And they are calling on the government to take action. Sky Science and Technology editor Tom Clark has more. The contents of two million Londoners' recycling bins ends up at this waste facility in Southwark. A lot of it's plastic, but perhaps more than you'd think. Campaign group Greenpeace asked volunteers to count the plastic going into their bins. It found an estimated 1.7 billion pieces get chucked each week, equating to 90 billion pieces a year. According to the recyclers, consumers aren't the problem. Regulations and taxes on plastic producers need to be tougher. I don't think today people are the blockers. We really, what we need today is from the government strong signal, strong incentives on, on, on the industry, the brands, the producers, uh, the waste management industry to really invest and, and, and do that, deliver that. Facilities like this end up having to sort out all our plastic waste. And they're very good at recycling things like hard plastic. It's milk bottles, drinks bottles. But when it comes to film plastic, plastic bags, crisp packets and the like, all of that has to be sent for incineration. Burning plastic waste has a carbon footprint similar to burning coal. No wonder Greenpeace wants plastics to pretty much disappear. At the moment, we're in the middle of really crucial negotiations for a UN Global Plastics Treaty. And we're asking the UK government to be, show huge ambition, be a leader in ambition in securing a treaty which will deliver a target for cutting plastic production. But binning plastic altogether could have unintended environmental consequences, according to new research. Switching from a plastic carrier bag to a paper bag leads to an 80% increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Emissions for pet food in a tin are around 70% higher than if it's in a plastic pouch. And an aluminium can of drink has a carbon footprint 50% higher than a plastic drinks bottle. This doesn't, of course, include the impact of plastics on the marine environment or microplastics on human health, but hints at a future for the right kind of plastic. Making all the packaging we throw away recyclable, better still, biodegradable, not made from fossil fuels. Innovations to replace the miracle material of the 20th century with one fit for the future. Tom Clark, Sky News. Uh, time for a bit of weather. There's a brisk northerly wind bringing further showers today. Looking more settled for the weekend, though, which is good news. Uh, there's going to be some blustery showers this evening, mainly concentrated in the north and east, with coastal gales developing across northern Scotland. Exposed north-facing coastal areas can expect further showers tonight, wintry on Scottish peaks, and there'll be a scattering over southern Britain. Otherwise, most inland areas are going to be dry, with a patchy frost developing under starry skies. Britain looking mostly fine tomorrow. Now, it's time for something weird or wonderful, which is what we always like to leave you with here on the UK tonight. Tonight is wonderful, don't worry. A <laughs> 13-year-old, uh, here he is. Uh, Harry Merlin Piper has just become the youngest ever winner of the Magic Circle's Young Magician of the Year Award. He conjured up this top award after performing sleight of hand tricks with lights and cards, as well as making his pencil case talk. He beat seven other contestants the accolade at the Magic Circle's Theatre in London, earlier this week. Harry, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Youngest ever winner and with a name like Harry Merlin, I mean, you were born to do it. <laughs> How did this all begin? Well, um, my dad, of course. My dad's a magician, so um, I started because of my dad. Pretty much, when I was born, my dad grabbed me and brought me straight to the theatre because he wanted me to be a magician. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Harry after Harry Potter or Harry Houdini? Harry Houdini. Important to get that in, important yes. to get that in. Then it's in. Merlin off of the magician Merlin. Of course. The wizard Merlin, and then it's Piper off my dad. Yeah, I mean, that, that'll yeah. do, won't it? That's yeah. a good, uh, that's a good um, magician legacy. And um, Now, you used to get into a bit of trouble at school for doing magic tricks, yeah, didn't so you? Yeah, so I caught, I got caught doing one of the hardest card moves, so it's a bit like this. Like this. Oh, wow. Like this. So you put four cards on your fingers. I think, like I've, I think I've had fake nails like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, and it was one of the hardest moves and I got caught doing it and they, <laughs> I said a joke. Uh, I was in an exam, doing a spelling exam, and I said I was doing spells, not spelling, to the teacher. Oh, very and good. <laughs> I went straight to detention. <laughs> Jokes as well as magic. But you incorporated that into your act. And yeah. you're going to show us one of your favourite tricks? Because yeah, I'm sure you get asked it all the time. Yeah. Hey, you're a magician, show us something. Yeah. Uh, do you want to see something then? Yeah, definitely. Perfect. So, 
Today, shh, you can't tell no one this, I'm going to tell you the secrets of the magic circle. OK. Shh, you can't tell no one. Um, my lips okay, are sealed. So here we've got a deck of cards, so just say stop for me. Stop. Put it there. So, uh, take the card, don't okay. show me. Now, it doesn't matter if I see it, cos right now I'm going to show you how the trick is done. OK. So you're going to get a little massive. Oh, fine. OK. You can't tell the magic circle, I don't want to get kicked out. OK. So, normally, when the people have got the card, I grab a little pen and I like to draw a little door. I'm not good at drawing. <laughs> Could be a window, but we'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So, a little door. And the thing that I'll do, I'll probably fix this up a bit. And, um... The thing that I do is, while they're at, while I'm asking for you, for you to look for the deck, yeah. um, I do this secretly when no okay. one's looking. And the thing that I do is... Uh, ooh, there's one card there. I, um, I grab the card. I yep. do like I put it in the middle, but I'm actually putting it on the bottom of the deck. OK. And then, uh, so, seven of diamonds, it doesn't matter if I see it, I put right. it on the bottom. So, what does that mean? When, they, when I slide the box, the card's back inside of the box. Yeah. <laughs> i got a little peeky-peeky. OK. Do you get what I mean? Mm. I'm not watching. Little peeky peeky. Stop it. Can I see yeah, that? Yeah, go on, have a little peeky peeky. Peeky peeky. That is an actual door. I had my nails done because I knew we were getting, doing <laughs> a card trick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, so the worst part about this trick is if they ask to examine the box. Okay. Because you're like, oh, I've got a door on the box, what should I do? Yeah. Well, I'm a real magician and I never break the rules of the magic circle. Stop it. Let me have a look at that. Have a look, have a look. Examine it. There's nothing there. Come on, show us another one. You want to see another one? Uh, anything? Uh, perfect. Uh, well, actually, with this deck, because the door right here, the door wasn't real, as you've seen. Yeah. But what does that mean? Because if the door's not real, yeah. there could be other stuff that are not real as well. OK. Do you, do you get what I mean or not? Yeah, I, get, yeah, yeah? I think so. I, I'll show you what I mean. So if the door wasn't real right over here, sometimes... Stop. And We've... look, dock it, knock it, give it a little... Is that real metal? We've got 45 seconds. What can we do in 45 seconds? I can do a quick trick. Have you got... Is that sugar over there? Yeah. For your cup of tea? Give, pass me over your sugar. See, really, in my cup of teas, I prefer sugar cubes. Yeah. Uh, so put your hand out for me, quickly. OK. I'm going to pull this out. Watch this. OK, we've got 30 sugar. seconds. Here we go. Two. Oh, Shouldn't there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Remember the name. <laughs> and if you Harry want to follow, if you Merlin want to... Piper. That's my name on Instagram. Ah. Uh, excellent. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us and good luck for the future. Harry Merlin Piper. I mean, I feel like you should disappear in a puff of smoke or something like that. Do you want me to do something? Go cool? on then. Okay, you ready? A fan of cards. Not only that, I can do something else. Oh. I hope a magic trick will clear <laughs> that up.